2018 presidential lecture. My name is Fred White. I'm the Associate Vice President for Engaged Learning. Twice a year, the presidential lecture series allows the university community to come together to discuss important topics with leading specialists. Past lectures have included two Pulitzer Prize winners, as well as nationally recognized experts in law and ethics, education and innovation, autism and public policy. Last fall, Dave Ulrich, one of the world's leading business thinkers, discussed with us effective leadership uh, and the human uh, resource profession. Last spring, we reveled in uh, Hannah Rosen's discussion of the end of men and the rise of women. That was a good one. <laughs> Each of these lectures has enriched the educational opportunities on our campus and has ignited further investigation of issues relevant for our university community. Today's guest follows in this tradition. General Michael Hayden visits us at an important time as the U.S. relations with North Korea and Russia continue to present complex challenges. His insights into America's position upon the global landscape is certain to engender more meaningful discussions following today's lecture. To this end, the Office of Engaged Learning promotes and supports these discussions that extend our institutional strategies for academic engagement and collaborative learning and civic lives with their educational aspirations. I will now ask President Holland to come to the stage, or to come to the fore, I guess, and to introduce our fall 2017 presidential lecturer, Michael Hayden. Students, staff, faculty, distinguished guests, welcome to Utah Valley University and to uh, join and joining us here for our presidential lecture. It's wonderful to see so many of you here today. General, I think this is the largest audience we've had so far with this series. In recent months, it's become evident that we are at a critical juncture as a global society. As various nations seek to assert their power and establish their legitimacy on the world stage through military one-upsmanship, the threat of global nuclear conflict has grown increasingly real. Aggressive, devastating terrorist activity has become a daily commonplace, it seems, that upends local and regional stability. And politically oppressive regimes and competing power structures have created humanitarian crises that are often overwhelming in their scope. In the face of such multifaceted threats, we as global citizens are tasked with wading through a cacophony of ever-changing, politically charged, and often partisan reporting to find the truth and navigate an ethical and deliberate and effective way forward. <clears throat> this reality makes me all the more grateful for those individuals who step forward to bring clarity to these difficult situations and help us to understand how we have gotten to this point and how we can best move forward together to find equitable and just solutions. Individuals like our fall 2017 presidential lecturer, General Michael Hayden. General Hayden is a retired United States Air Force four-star general. He is also the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency and the National Security Agency, the only individual to date to hold both of these critical leadership positions. During his appointments, he was on the front line of global change, the war on terrorism, and the growing cyber challenge. In addition to leading the CIA and NSA, he was the country's first principal deputy officer in the country. In all of these positions, he worked to put a human face on American intelligence, explaining to the American people the role of espionage in protecting both American security and American liberty. General Hayden is currently a principal at the Chertoff Group and a distinguished professor, a visiting professor at the George Mason University Shar School of Policy and Government. His recent memoir, Plain to the Edge, American Intelligence in the Age of Terror, has been a New York Times bestseller and was recently selected as one of the 100 most notable books of 2016. General Hayden has been a frequent expert and commentator on major news outlets and in top publications. He is valued for his experience on intelligence matters like government surveillance, 
geopolitics, and cybersecurity. General Hayden and the audience will surely be interested to know that UVU has taken an active role in these areas ourselves, having launched a National Security Studies program, and just this semester, having launched a Master's of Science program in cybersecurity, complementing our five existing pathway programs towards undergraduate degrees and certificates. As a university, we have partnered with the National Cybersecurity Alliance to serve as their national educational arm, and as such, we have worked with them to launch a student-driven cybersecurity awareness saturation campaign focused on targeted cybersecurity messaging. Because of our partnership with the NCSA, UVU participated in the launch of Cybersecurity Awareness Month in Washington, D.C. just this past week, and the event was co-sponsored by the NCSA and the Organization of American States. General, we're trying to do our part, and it is a great honor and a help to us to have you today to move us forward. It's with that that I say welcome to Utah Valley University. We enjoy hearing from you your remarks titled Hot Spots at Home and Around the World. Thank you. Thank you. All right. First, first thing to check, we're on. You hearing? Good. All right. Thanks uh, for the very generous uh, introduction, Mr. President. Um, so we got a lot to cover. I'm a 40-year GI, so you know, you don't get many sentences out of me without view graphs, all right? <laughs> so we're going to use PowerPoint. Uh, and I'm, if, if I do this well, I'm going to leave some time at the end, 15 minutes or more, where you all get to kind of jump up and ask questions and offer commentary. And that's frankly the part I look forward to. So I will work very hard to give you that opportunity, okay? All right. So I, I used not to have this slide in the presentation. This is the one my Army buddies call the uh, big hand little map briefing slide, you know, where you, you get to go this way, all right? You know, it's kind of very generalized stuff. Three sentences, okay, number one, I'm old enough to, to claim I've actually lived in a world more dangerous than today. Now, that probably doesn't apply to you students, probably not even to you faculty members, probably not your students' parents, but talk to your grandparents, all right? And they, like me, will be able to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. They, like me, will be able to remember Soviet and American armor barrel to barrel at Checkpoint Charlie in, in downtown Berlin. I was a captain in America's Air Force. We went to DEFCON 3, General De Defense Condition 3. Five is peace, one is nuclear war. We went to three when we thought the Soviets were shipping funny weapons through the Bosporus and the Dardanelles to their allies, the Arabs, with an Israeli army on the African side of the Suez Canal and nothing between them and Cairo except sand. Okay? So I've actually lived in a more dangerous world, as bad as this seems. Now, recently I put the word probably up there, all right? Because I'm beginning to hedge my bets. And if, <laughs> and if you're bringing back in six or eight months, then we may not have bullet number one up there, all right? <laughs> but right now, I've lived in a more dangerous world. I've never lived in a world more complicated, and I, and I really mean that. I, I, I did this for a living for 40 years. I mean, I'm supposed to figure this stuff out. We could fill all the available time you and I have together with me just listing for you the participants in the Syrian civil war. Okay? For me to kind of slice and dice everybody there under arms and what it is they're fighting for will fill the next 30 to 40 minutes. That's how complicated current events are. So more dangerous, yes. Never more complicated, never more immediate. And here, here, I, I, I don't mean just the fact you and I are going to be able to watch somebody's unhappy cell phone video tonight from some unhappy point on earth. I don't mean just the communications. I mean the impact. You know, some, something goes bump over here, immediately and substantially, things in our lives change as well. Uh, a real quick example. I, I think President Obama tried to isolate the Syrian problem as a very, very bad humanitarian question, but uh, not, no U.S. vital interest at risk, we can probably be a bit standoffish. Until a million Syrians walked into Europe. Do you see the, the connectivity? All right, so three broad general premises. Okay, let's move on. 
So there are lots of ways of doing this. I've, I've got a few examples up here. I could actually just walk around this slide, just use this view graph, tell interesting stories about each of the images there. I think it would be productive, useful. I know it would be interesting. I'll start top right, talk a little bit about the fun-loving Kim family of North Korea, <laughs> and work our way all the way around to anonymous. Useful, productive, but probably not most useful, most productive. That, that is a little bit like, so what are you going to see in that cell phone video tonight, right? Kind of predicting the evening news. I therefore shift to what you see at about the 12 o'clock position. I shift to tectonics. All right? I am not going to try to predict where the, where the earth's going to shake tonight or what part of the seas are going to roil. All right? I'm going to go under. I'm going to go down to those basal geopolitical plates that are moving and indeed are going to cause the earth to shake and the seas to roil somewhere. But that part's hard to predict. This is a little more substantial. This is a little more, yeah, I see what's going on here. So what it is I've got, I've got four or five tectonics that I, that I want to go through. And, and, and more or less, I think these basal fundamental movements are what's making the world the way it is we are experiencing it. Okay? Tectonics. All right. Tectonic one. That's Brent Scowcroft. He used to be my boss. Brent was National Security Advisor not once, but twice. He was National Security Advisor for Ford and for Bush 41, George H.W. Brent wrote an article more than five years ago now, April 2012, for the Atlantic Council. And, and I'm going to tell you more than what's in the article, because I read the article and I thought, this is really interesting. And since I used to work for Brent, I walked up to his office at Farragut Square and said, loved your article, let's talk. And he told me more about it, all right? But you can get to the article online. In essence, what Brent says is, you know, when I was doing my thing, all the pieces on the board I cared about were nation states. And the way I moved those pieces around was through a process that we have now taken to call hard power. Those of you not running around D.C. recently, hard power, masses of men and metal at the right place and at the right time. And if we liked you, the promise of, and if we didn't like you, the threat of masses of men and metal. So Brent says, when I was playing, nation states, hard power. He says, they're still important. But here's the punchline. They're not nearly as important as they were when I was National Security Advisor. Because I was National Security Advisor at the height, Ford, and the back end, 41, of the industrial era. And he goes through this kind of economic history thing in, in which he says the industrial era trended to pull power to the center. Put another way, you couldn't get things done in the industrial era without an empowered center. Um, examples. I'm old enough to remember when making a telephone call was so complicated <laughs> that we could entrust it only to a government or a government-controlled monopoly. And there are some people in this room who, who actually r remember that. The industrial era, kind of the, the linear way things were teed up and solved, pulled power to the center. The Republican Party, Abraham Lincoln, first president, emancipation, well known for that. They spent the rest of the 19th century building the infrastructure that American industry relied on to burst into the world in the 20th century as the world's preeminent industrial power. Communism, bad theory of history, worst theory of government. But if you want to rapidly industrialize a backward agrarian near feudal society, eh, not bad. <laughs> because it pulls power, power to the center, right? But what Brent points out is that we don't live there anymore. We are no longer in the industrial era. We are in the post-industrial, globalized, interconnected, worldwide, digital, fill in your adjectives, but you know, you know where I'm going, right? And, and Brent's point is, as the industrial era required power to be pulled to the center, the post-industrial era pushed power down and to the edges. I'm old enough, once again, to remember I used to have to get out of the house, get in the car, drive the car, park the car, get out of the car, go into a building and talk to a human being to get my money. <laughs> now, the students here are going, money, what an interesting concept. <laughs> because, right? Right? Yeah, you're, you're totally, totally digital. 
Sure. Uh, how many in the room have used Zillow? Okay, yeah, all right. One or two clicks, how long on the market, current price, previous price, comparables. Yeah, you used to have to go to a professional, licensed class of human beings to get that information not so long ago. And so this French thing, power down, power to the edge, pretty cool. You and I are empowered to do things we have never been able to do. Uh, in my old world, I'm old enough to remember only two countries could take pictures from space. And only one of them did it really well. <laughs> and I don't know about your Wi-Fi here, but if it's pretty good, you can go on Google Earth while we're talking, and you can raise your hand halfway through the remarks, and you can tell me whether or not Kim the youngest is stacking an intercontinental ballistic missile. Power down, power to the edge. So for the most part, that's awesome. I'm also old enough to remember I never lost any sleep over a religious fanatic living in a cave in the Hindu Kush. But we do. And, and, and that's Brent's point. All right? If something's going to go bump tonight and make our world unhappy, I'm betting you it will not be because a malevolent nation state tried to hurt us. If something's going to go bump tonight, it's going to be because some sub-state, group, gang, actor, or individual now has the ability to inflict on us damage that we used to associate only with malevolent nation states. This is a big tectonic. I'm going to spend a little more time on this one than the others. Yeah, you're probably why the current intelligence briefer up here has got the map of the European discoveries of the, of the Western Hemisphere. Um, this is lifted from a, a display at the wonderful Maritime Museum in San Diego. And it talks about the Great Age of Sail. Okay? And it says about 500 years ago, in the Great Age of Sail, the ocean-going sailing ship connected societies that up until that point had been developing autonomously, independently, pretty much unknown to one another. And with the great age of sail, they get connected, and we see the greatest explosion in human science, human learning, human commerce that we had ever seen up to that point. We also got the global slave trade, global piracy, and global epidemics. And this is connectivity at 12 knots an hour with a favoring wind. <laughs> and you and I are wired at 186,000 miles a second. So these things here are a byproduct of what I've been trying to describe. Power down, power to the edge. Now, I get it. Any of this can be used by a nation state. But you've got you, you to concede, none of these require a nation state to inflict great harm on the United States. They are, I, I know they're different, but they are the byproduct of power down, power out, and interconnectivity. And so we're, we're trying to deal with this. Uh, we, we've been trying to deal with terrorism for the last 15 years, and I, we won't go into it. If, if you're curious, hit me with it in the Q&A. We argue about how to deal with terrorism because it's so new, and we're hardwired to defend ourselves against nation states. So how, how then do we use that structure that the general and I are very accustomed to to fight nation states and now use it to fight subnational actors? That gets you the whole argument over renditions, detentions, interrogations, surveillance, targeted killings. Okay? But we've kind of hashed our way through most of those. We have not even begun to argue about how to deal with this one. How do we defend ourselves in what is, frankly, the most ungoverned space in the history of the human experience? So, tectonic one. The changing nature of power, the changing relevance of states. Big deal. Going to be with us a long time. All right. Tectonic 2. So I'm up in Baltimore, all right? I'm invited up there by the Republican congressional leadership. Every year, the Republicans, kind of February-ish, <clears throat> come back home, come back to D.C. from home districts after a constituent weekend, and they all get together, all the members of the House, all the members of the Senate, usually do it on the eastern seaboard. In 16, it was in Baltimore. This year, it was in Philadelphia. Bring the kids, bring the wife. Put them up in a nice hotel in the Inner Harbor in Baltimore. They get to go to the aquarium. And the members then go to a conference room, big ballroom in the hotel. And they try to hammer out common Republican positions on core issues. I'm sorry. I'm pausing just for the laughter there after that statement. <laughs> <clears throat> 
it's really hard for all parties. It seems to be particularly hard for the Republicans. Um, so I, I'm sure there was a panel on the deficit and a panel on entitlements. I'm on the panel for national security. And I was really proud to be on that panel. Mike Chertoff, former Secretary of Homeland Security. Ray Odierno, he just left being Chief Staff of America's Army. Ryan Crocker, uh, Ryan, uh, diplomat's diplomat. He has been our ambassador to every ugly spot on earth. We have sent him to Kabul, to Baghdad, Islamabad. He was in the Beirut embassy as a junior officer when it was blown up. Okay. Ryan Crocker, me, and Bob Kagan. Uh, Bob's a scholar, historian, down at the Brookings Institution. Very highly regarded think tank, very center of the road think tank in DC. All right, so we're on the panel. First of all, I just named five people on the panel. If any of you people watch Fox News after six o'clock at night, you know five people is way too many to be putting on a panel. So now we're getting questions from the moderator, right? And we're doing okay. Then the Republicans start jumping in. They start asking questions from the floor. And then they don't start asking questions of us. They start challenging the last Republican who asked a question. Now, it wasn't quite chaotic, but you're getting, okay? At which point, in the midst of all this, Kagan, the Brookings historian, political scientist, Bob kind of levitates out of his chair, kind of puts his arms like, out like he's Moses or something, and, <laughs> and, and says, look, What's going on here is the melting down of the post-World War II American liberal Bretton Woods World Bank world order. Huh? I had the thought, damn, Bob, that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> and he's right. And I throw up a couple of exemplary visuals here for you. The world order, which is now deteriorating, not because anybody's going over there with a chisel, all right? It is deteriorating because the world on which it was based is now rapidly changing. Check out tectonic number one, okay? The world order we're leaving, the American liberal order, obviously by definition, has made an America on it. It has been sustained by American diplomacy, statecraft, American values, and American power for 75 years. And by the way, if you invite me back in a couple hundred years and we're doing a, a retrospective on this, we're getting more than a gentleman's see. We, we didn't do a bad, I, I got Korea and Vietnam and you know, all those crises. We did not do a bad job. The last 75 years are the healthiest, best nourished, long lived, best educated, most peaceful three quarters of a century in the history of the human species. And it was largely organized by American ideas and American power behind those ideas. And Bob's big point was, yeah, but those structures will become less and less relevant to the world that exists underneath it. So, I'm, I'm, so in, in, in essence, we're seeing the melting down of the post-World War II order. So I'm in my car coming back down to Baltimore Washington Parkway after this seance with the Republicans in the Inner Harbor. <laughs> <clears throat> and I had the thought, as good as Kagan was, he may have lowballed it. We may be seeing not just the melting down of the post-World War II order, we are seeing the melting down of the post-World War I order too. And by the way, the overall title for this tectonic is things we thought were permanent, <laughs> they're not. So, take, take a look at that map. Now for some of the people in the room, that's the map you grew up with. And for me, it was the Sisters of Mercy who lied to me, okay, and said that was the map. When in reality, it was merely a map. There are countries on that map I grew up with that I just assumed a sense of permanence that no longer exist. Czechoslovakia, gone. Velvet divorce, Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, move on. Yugoslavia, Yuk, South, Slav, Slav. Land of the South Slavs, gone. Nothing velvet. Quarter million people dead for the dissolution of Yugoslavia. Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, gone. Now, not created at Versailles, but created at the same time as Versailles, all right? So, again, things we thought were permanent, proving not to be permanent. Now, go a little bit further east. Let me suggest to you some conclusions. <clears throat> Iraq doesn't exist. And it's not coming back. In fact, the only organized military force in Iraq today fighting on behalf of what you thought was Iraq by the 5,500 GIs. Everybody else is fighting for something else. Okay? 
Syria, gone. Not coming back. Now, I, I, I need a college audience. Uh, you guys follow in detail. So, I, yeah, Syria's probably going to keep a seat in the United Nations. Okay? Iraq's probably going to keep a seat in the United Nations. You know, Bosnia's got a seat in the United Nations. I've been to Bosnia. It doesn't exist either. You got, you, got a, you, got a, you, got a, you got a Muslim state in the middle. You got Republic of Serbsk over here. And Herzegovina is fully incorporated into Croatia. But we pretend there's a Bosnia and they get a seat in New York at the UN. I'm suggesting to you that the historic unified state of Iraq is gone and is not coming back. The historic unified state of Syria is gone and is not coming back. Lebanon, eh, we'll see. Libya, gone, not, not coming back. I was doing a Morning Joe thing about two years ago. And we were talking about Secretary Kerry trying yet one more time to get a workable ceasefire in Syria. And they were about ready to cut the commercial. I'm in D.C. They're up in New York. I'm about ready to cut the commercial. <clears throat> and Scarborough or somebody says something about it. And Secretary Kerry has said, this may be our last chance to preserve a unified Syria. And I kind of yelled down from the D.C. office, hey, Joe, can I add one more thing before you break? Yeah, General, what you got? That train, Joe, has so far left the station, you cannot see the smoke from the engine. Okay? <laughs> We are not putting Syria back together. Um, I'm probably being a little bit provocative in my language, uh, you know, a, a little binary, you know, wide brush, bright colors. But I fundamentally, I think what I'm telling you is true. And, 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 so, and so when somebody says, you know, we've got to get rid of that Bashar al-Assad and get a good government in Syria, I agree with the first part. You've got to get rid of that Bashar al-Assad. But there is no Syria to govern. All right? And I do think it will remain a fractured society for as long as we can see. So, my point, things that seem perfect, so that, so that if, 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 if you're looking at the, te at the tectonic, all right, uh, if you're not aware of the tectonic, you're saying, well, we've got to fix the government of Syria. But if you're looking at the tectonic, things that seem permanent are, are really not permanent, you know that's not a very sensible sentence because Syria no longer, no longer exists. So, melting down to the post-World War II order, melting down to the post-World War I order. Let, let, me, let me go long on you, for all you who study history. We're also seeing a few melting around the edges of the Treaty of Westphalia, too, from 1648. For those of you not following along closely at home, uh, this is the treaty that ended the Thirty Years' War in Europe. This is the treaty that ended the last great war of religion within Christendom. It is the treaty by which, frankly, we date being modern. Okay, you get your textbooks, you get to 1648, chapter heading is the modern era. Because that's when we decided to separate the sacred from the secular. That's where we decided to take the coercive power of the state, put it over there, put differences of theology over here. Now, you know, it's not a perfect world. We've had examples in our own history where that's not been quite the case, but fundamentally, that's been the principle. Okay? The world will be governed by secular nation states. And we exported that idea around the planet during the era of European imperialism, and we carved up the world into secular nation states. And we naturally assumed, and that settled that question once and for all, for all of humanity. Not so fast. We have another great monotheism, this time Islam, that feels as if it gets a chance to answer that question too. And fundamentally, what is going on within Islam is really closely parallel to what went on within Christendom in the 17th century. It's that faith and reason thing. It's that role of the state and role of, role of re religion thing. And, and Islam is going through that struggle. By the way, our struggle was incredibly bloody. About 20% of the Germ Germanic-speaking population of Europe died in the Thirty Years' War. And so, I guess I'm cautioning you, don't look down your noses at these people. Our history has this, has this chapter as well. They got social media. That's what makes it seem worse. But historically, we're seeing, we're seeing great parallels. And by the way, it would be arrogant for us to assume they're going to end up with the same compromise that Christendom ended up with. Okay? They may actually end up with, with something not quite as binary as we did because, frankly, Islam is a bit more of a transcendental religion, uh, the will of God as opposed to the, to the reason of man. I mean, I, we're, we're all people of the book. We were all children of Abraham. We all came out of the same desert. But Christianity gets washed through the Greeks. 
before it gets to Europe. And so we, we, get, a, we get an overlay of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle within our Christianity, which was, is not in the historical experience of Islam. So we'll see where this turns out. The reason I'm dwelling on this is that what, I'm, what I want to tell you, under this tectonic, things that seem permanent, all right, the center of gravity in this troubled topic, the center of gravity is a war within a civilization. It is not a war between civilizations. As some Muslims, we call them Al-Qaeda, and some Americans would like you to believe. Okay? The center of gravity of this is a war within Islam. Now, I get it. San Bernardino was intentional. Um, Orlando was intentional. Paris, intentional. Brussels, intentional. All right? Barcelona, intentional. But at its core, those acts were spillage from what is fundamentally a Muslim-on-Muslim -Muslim war, and overwhelmingly the people who are dying in this war are followers of the prophet, not, not of Jesus, not of Abraham. All right? And so I, I think it's a very important thing to remember. By the way, the more we want to make it a war between civilizations, the more we follow the narrative of the side in the civil war we want to lose. Who want this to be, there is undying enmity between the West and the religion of the prophet. So we need to be careful. So that's the second tectonic, all right? Things that seem permanent, proving not to be. It, it, it's kind of a suggestion to you that as important as current events are, we really, we really do need a bit of deep historical understanding to see what's going on now. Okay, uh, tectonic three, a little more traditional. This is kind of the nuclear thing, the proliferation thing. I, I title it, states that are ambitious, brittle, and nuclear. Okay, so who do I have in here? Well, this is actually where I rack and stack the Russians. All right, and there you can see the quick bullets on the right-hand side of the slide. The Russians are reinvesting in their nuclear forces, which is really an irritant for us. We thought we were done with this. We're going to have to go spend a whole bunch of your tax money now to, to kind of re-up our nuclear forces because the Russians are modernizing. All right? That's just, sorry. I thought we were done with this, but, but we're not. This nuclear rearmament on the part of the Russians, this belief in nuclear first use, this blending of nuclear forces within their exercise is on top of all this other stuff that the Russians are doing. So let me spend a minute here dwelling on Vladimir Vladimirovich and what it is he might be up to. President Obama actually said the Russians are at best a regional power. And I actually think President Obama is right. Okay? Uh, the Russians, are, 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 they are lacking or running out of the things you would got to have if you want to be somebody in the 21st century, all right? They're already run out of democracy, okay? They're quickly running out of entrepreneurship. When was the last time you bought something from Russia that wasn't energy, fish eggs, or a matryoshka doll? <laughs> okay? Running out of democracy, running out of entrepreneurship, not quite running out of energy, but it's, it's 50 a barrel or so, and it's never going above that, because if it does, we just go up to Erie and start throwing switches in Marcellus Shell, and we, we drive oil prices down. So they're never going to get energy more than $50 a barrel. And so not running out of energy, but running out of the profits, from, running out of entrepreneurship, running out of democracy, running out of profits from energy. Oh, yeah, running out of Russians. This is a declining population. A little bit with a problem on the front end, all right? But mostly the problem on the back end, life expectancy which is below that of the Soviet Union. Wow. Primary causes of death for Russian young men, traffic accidents, violence, and substance abuse. Okay, so here's your quality of life picture. Um, so that presents Vladimir with a problem. You know, the old social contract, Vladimir won, you know, he's president for a couple of terms, then he had to take a break for Medvedev to be president. Yeah, Vladimir won social contract once, hey, I'm gonna be autocratic, you shouldn't worry about that, you're kinda used to that, you're Russians, all right? And oh, by the way, you're going to be rich. Oil was about 110 a barrel. Now we're in a world which I told you it's 50. And so he can't say, don't worry. Price of energy, sanctions. He can't, he can't do the back half of the contract. Right? So the new contract is, hey, I'm going to be autocratic, but don't worry. 
you're going to be proud. And what you see is an expansion of Russia into the post-Soviet space with the seizure of Abkhazia, the seizure of South Ossetia, the seizure of Crimea, the pressure on the Donbass and the eastern Ukraine, kind of thumping their chest at the Baltic states, the incidents at sea and in air and international waters and airspace with American and NATO, NATO aircraft. And some recent events here in this country. Now I'm going to give you a cartoon, all right? Bear with me, it's going to sound an awful lot like Scooby-Doo on Saturday morning. But I'm going to come to a truth, all right? Picture, if you will, Vladimir over here eating lunch at the kitty table, all right? He's got the small chairs. And the big people over here, you know, us, France, China, over here at the big people's table. And Vladimir desperately wants to sit at the big people's table. But I already told you, his chair's not going to fit. So every night, he goes over to the big people's table with a saw and hacks off about a half, three quarters of an inch from that table. And he figures if he does that enough nights, sooner or later, one day, he's going to be able to take his chair. I told you this was a cartoon. He's going to be able to take his chair, slide it over, push it up to the big, big people's table, and it's going to look like it just fits perfectly. Which is my Scooby-Doo Saturday morning cartoonish way of describing Russian support for Brexit, Russian efforts to de-unify the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, Russian efforts to break up the European Union, Russian efforts to delegitimize Western democratic processes, and Russian efforts to make you lose confidence in the American presidential election system. He's sawn off the legs of the table because he can't make his chair bigger. He's trying to bring us down to his level by delegitimizing things you and I think distinguish us from the kind of government he's running. All right, Russia, nuclear power. Uh, Iran, not quite nuclear, but could be. Now, I'm not going to argue about the Iranian uh, nuclear deal and whether the president's going to decertify it next week or not. I'm just going to assume the deal works. All right? Now, I've written a lot of stuff saying I wish the deal said that. I wish the, I, got, I, got, I got problems with the deal. I'm just going to assume I'm all wrong. John Kerry's right. Ernie Moniz, Secretary of Energy, is right. And it's going to do everything they said. And the Iranians aren't going to cheat. Frankly, I don't think they are because I think the deal is too good for them. But that's separate. All right. If that is true, the deal works as planned. In 10 or 11 years, Iran will be an industrial strength nuclear nation never more than a few weeks away from enough fissile material for a nuclear weapon. That's the deal. We just delay it. We don't stop it. Then you got these guys, the Pakistanis. There's a group in Washington called the Fund for Peace that racks and stacks the countries of the world by stability. All right? It's a pretty scientific system. They've got about a dozen categories, and everybody gets a score in each of the categories. Then they aggregate the scores, and then they just kind of list everybody. If you're curious about your homeland, fellow Americans, we're not really right near the top. Okay? We are actually in the second tier of nations. All right? We get marked down for distribution of wealth and failed political processes. What could they be talking about? <laughs> okay. um, if you want to know who's up at the top, uh, Finland, Norway, Sweden, the Aussies are up there, the Canadians are up there. Take heart, we are the first continental-sized nation on the list. Okay. But we digress, we're on the wrong end of the list. We need to go to the other end. That's where these guys are. Okay? Pakistan is in the mid-teens, wrapped right around Burundi and Zimbabwe. They have 120 nuclear weapons, and they are making nuclear weapons faster than any other country on Earth. And then, kind of to current events, Kim, Kim the youngest, and what's going on there? Um, they are never giving up their weapons. They would be suicidal to give up their weapons. He is not irrational. He is coldly, calculatingly ra rational. He's seen the movie, the one marked Muammar Gaddafi. He's seen the movie, the one marked Saddam Hussein. He's even seen the movie marked Ukraine. Remember, they gave up their nuclear weapons in return for in perpetuity territorial guarantees from, among other nations, the Russian Federation. He knows what happens to people who don't have this stuff. He's never giving it up. And so if the American position is, we're not stopping until he gives it up, we're going to have a war in Northeast Asia. So we're, 
that's why I am a bit concerned with current language. Uh, Secretary Tillerson, Secretary Mattis, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, they're tough. They talk tough. But they talk tough about, don't ever use this. You're going to regret the day you use this. President Trump is less clear. He occasionally says that. But he also seems to say from time to time is, don't even have this, which is a big difference from don't, don't use this. And so I, I, I do fear we're, we're flying by and we may end up in a very dark place. Uh, did you all see the photo op for the COCOMs last Thursday? Combatant commanders, the four stars. It, 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 a lot of the seven by 24. So the combatant commanders, uh, Pacific Command, European Command, Central Command, they, they come in for a conference about twice a year, uh, maybe it's more often. Uh, for some of them, they go to the White House, they meet with the president, they have dinner. They're, they're all in their taxes, they're all in their mess dress. All right? And so they're there for a photo op with the president. And the president, I think very impromptu, unscripted, says, well, this is very nice. You can call this the calm before the storm. At which point the press people in the room go, huh, what do you say? What do you mean calm before the storm, Mr. President? You'll see, you'll see. And then later, later the president actually criticizes the four stars. He actually says, you guys need to speed it up when I ask you for options. Which I think is the president expressing displeasure with the reluctance of the uniformed military to jump into some of these scenarios that he might be wanting them to deliver to him. So I just, I'm gonna leave it there. I, I got more and you can do it in the Q&A, but we are, we are in a really touchy place because remember where I began, he's not giving them up. And so what is it we define as success in what we're doing? All right. Uh, the fourth tectonic, also very traditional, that's the rise of China. Uh, let me tell you what I've told every audience for the last 10 years, which means before I even I left government, China is not an enemy of the United States of America. And I can't think of any good reasons for China ever to be an enemy of the United States. There are logical, non-heroic policy choices available to us and the Chinese to keep the relationship competitive. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, occasionally confrontational, probably never has to get to the level of conflict. And then I add, people like me, and I talk to people like me, spend as much time worrying about Chinese failure as we do Chinese success, Chinese weakness as we do Chinese strength. Now these guys pulled off a miracle. They have dragged 400 million people into a genuine middle class existence in about two generations. That has never happened before. That's awesome. But it's not without issues. They've got problems, and they are structural problems. All right, uh, top right, median age of the population in the United States and in China. You see that China, very shortly, is going to be demographically older than the United States. That's weird, okay? Because we are a post-industrial post society. They are still industrial. And so the fact that they're aging faster than we are is, 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 is unusual. Now, I get to say this in Utah, Part of that is the birth rate in certain portions of the United States. Seriously. <laughs> Part of that is American immigration. Right? So we are a younger society than a lot of our European friends. All right? Nonetheless, the fact that an industrializing society is going to get older than us, that's amazing. One Chinese demographer said this will be the first time in the world when an industrializing nation gets old before it gets rich. Uh, top left environmental catastrophe, lower left, maldistribution of wealth. Uh, in the center, okay, two presidents yelling at one another. I cannot think of anything less productive for Chinese foreign policy than what these two guys are doing. Okay? The Chinese want to expand their influence in, in the region. What Kim is doing, it, it, Sounds like Godfather 3 and Michael saying, every time I try to get out, they pull me back in. Okay. He is causing the United States of America to remain, strengthen its position in a region that the Chinese would like to gradually become more under their influence, if not control. And Kim is making the whole neighborhood happy that the Americans are coming back. You can't think of anything worse from a Chinese from a Chinese perspective. So, the, the Chinese are, like I said, economic miracle, 
We got white water up ahead. It's a little bit like the Chinese. I'm sorry, a little bit like the Russians. What's the social contract? Why? Let me go back one here. Yeah. Whoop. Back the other way. The other back. There we go. Lower left-hand corner. That fellow with President Obama is Xi Jinping, the president of China. My irreverent question is, who died and made him king? Okay. And then the answer is, well, he's head of the Communist Party. And I go, yeah? So why is he in charge? Because you realize governance there has nothing to do with Marx, Engels, Lenin, even Mao. If you look up here, governance there has to do with my, my left arm, which is my cartoonish description of Chinese GDP growth over the last 20 years. Okay? Now, those of you who studied the project know they were lying. <laughs> Wasn't that good. And I think everyone agrees that's going to happen. In other words, the economy has gotten to a point that we're not going to have that, that, that explosive productivity growth. They're in what economists call the middle income trap. And they're, going to, they're going to hit some economic problems going forward. And, and again, their social contract was, was a little bit like Vlad's. Hey, I'll be autocratic, but it's okay. We're all going to be rich. And if that's the case, how do you do it? Same answer as Vlad. If I can't make you rich, I'll make you proud. And we do see an increase in Chinese nationalism. I just got a few examples up there. Lower left-hand corner, that's the, the nine dash line. That's Chinese territorial water claims in the South China Sea. They believe they should be able to treat that body of water encompassed by those dashes the way you and I treat Lake Michigan. Okay. Um, Graham Allison is a um, historian, political scientist up at Harvard, the Kennedy School. And Graham's been down to DC a couple of times to fulfill government jobs. Graham just recently wrote a book called Destined for War. Very pessimistic title, all right? <clears throat> but the book is about what he calls the Thucydides trap. It goes all the way back to the historian who talked about Athens and Sparta. What the book is about, and bear with me because this is very important. What the book is about is, you know what? We've seen this before. This is all about the emerging power, China, and the status quo power, the United States. And you know, this goes way back to the Peloponnesian War. You know, how did those poor people in Sparta put up with all those uppity folks from Athens? And then Graham fast forwards it to the last 500 years, you know, the 500 after the, the ships I showed you. Remember the European discovery? Yeah, he starts the clock then and says, we have seen in the modern era, that voyage of discovery up until yesterday, we have seen this emerging status quo thing 17 times. His first example is, how does Prince Henry the Navigator's Portugal deal with a unified Spain under Ferdinand and Isabel? And he plays it all the way forward to, how are France and Great Britain dealing with a recently unified Germany? And he has 17 examples, status quo emerging. Right? And he says in the book, we always get there. We always get from the old equilibrium, pre-emergence, to the new equilibrium, post-emergence. He does, however, point out in the 17 historical cases that he has, the methodology by which you go from the old to the new is a process that goes by the popular name, global war. And so I guess I'll end this tectonic by saying, it's job one. The Sino-American relationship is the core key international political issue of the 21st century. Get this right, we'll manage the other stuff. Get this wrong, the other stuff doesn't matter. All right, that's four tectonics, right? Changing nature of power, things that seem permanent aren't, proliferation, China. I said I had four or five. You're probably wondering, well, well there are your slides, Aiden. Do you have four or five? You probably know. Uh, the reason I say that is uh, number five is weird. Number five is you. And if we weren't doing this in the valley here, and I wasn't the head of CIA formally, but the, say the head of DGSE, and we were in the beautiful French as opposed to the beautiful Utah countryside, and I was talking about les tectoniques rather than tectonics, all right? This would be on my list, and it would not be number five. This is a really big deal. What is it we think our role is in that world I just described for you. Remember, we're leaving the one that had stamp made in America on it, right? It's hard for me to do. I'm an Intel guy. So now I'm gonna go talk about us, so I don't, I don't make it up. I just, I just divert to a scholar whose judgment I trust. So I divert to Walter Russell Mead, okay, is an American historian, 
And, and Professor Mead, and I, I've not just read him, I've, I've talked with him. Professor Mead says, you can describe any American presidency in one of four historic models, all right? And he, he slaps on uh, an historic name on each of the four models. He said, look, we've, we, we could have Hamiltonian presidents. Okay, Alexander Hamilton, uh, Washington's aide-de-camp, first secretary of the treasury, beautiful voice, I've heard him on Broadway. <laughs> Hamiltonian foreign policy. America cannot be free unless America is prosperous. America cannot be prosperous unless America is strong. That's actually pretty tight. That's, that's actually pretty clear. All right? Mitt Romney, he, he would have been Hamiltonian. And, and, and not because of uh, Bain Capital or anything. Because what I just told you, America cannot be free unless America is prosperous. America can't be prosperous unless America is strong, was not a quote from Hamilton. It is a quote from Mitt Romney during the second presidential debate in 2012. Hamiltonian, Wilsonian, American idealism, the war to end all wars, the war to make the world safe for democracy, kind of re repackaging manifest destiny of the 19th century, putting into an export version and sharing or occasionally imposing it on the rest of the world. Wilson, American idealism. Jefferson, all right, I know, he bought Louisiana and he fought, he fought a war in North Africa, I get that. But fundamentally, he was inward turning. He was kind of the shining city on the hill president. We got stuff at home. We got to do stuff here. Jefferson, inward turning. Then finally, Jackson. Okay? Um, Meade, Meade's a little careful with his description of a Jacksonian president. Now, Jackson, man of the frontier, Indian fighter, war hero, first Democrat in the White House. And it really doesn't matter whether you want to spell it with a big D or a little D, he was both. First Democrat in the White House. Meade's description of Jacksonian foreign policy is, you know, kind of like the people who watch Fox News, okay? My description is a foreign policy organized around Robert De Niro's immortal line in Taxi Driver. You talking to me? <laughs> uh, the president I served the most was President Bush. He was clearly Wilsonian. Read the second inaugural. Take a look at the freedom agenda. He had more than a little dose of Jackson going on there, too. There was an incident on the South Lawn, helicopter landed, president's in a golf shirt. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking he's just coming back from Camp David. I wasn't there, but I've seen the, the video. All the man wants to do is get into his house. But you know, you got the reporters all lined up there, and they're yelling questions at him. He's walking past the reporters, and they're yelling. Finally, one reporter yells out, what about that insurgency in Iraq, Mr. President? It's looking really bad. Remember, he didn't have to do anything. He stops, turns, pivots. Steps, points, bring it on. Pure Jackson. Okay. If you are Wilsonian and Jacksonian, you might be leaning a little forward in your foreign activity. President Obama, I think, was equally Wilsonian. All right? Read the speech in Ankara. Read the speech in Cairo. For God's sake, the president gave a speech in Prague in which he was aiming for a world without nuclear weapons, and he was serious. All right? That's really Wilsonian. But he had a real big dose of Jefferson going on. Otherwise, you don't get the tide of wars receding, Al-Qaeda's on the run, and it is time to do nation building at home. In fact, a lot of folks like me criticized the Obama team for being indecisive. I think they really were. But another way of looking at their indecision was that their inner Wilsons were in, in an eternal combat with their inner Jeffersons. We really ought to, but we shouldn't. And he ended up with indecision. Okay, even way out here in Utah, you know we had an election, right? And we got a new president. <laughs> Walter Russell Mead puts President Trump squarely in the Jacksonian tradition. And that quote I have up there is from Mead, all right? Describing Trump, Jacksonian foreign policy. Nationalist, populist, on a dark day, nativist, okay, suspicious of the outside world, and willing to use force to beat it back. They are not naturally internationalists, unless you really make them mad. And then they're really mean-spirited. That's why you get President Trump during the campaign saying, I'm not going to kill just terrorists, I'm going to kill their families too, which is kind of a Jacksonian-rooted thing. 
I put this up here because I, you know, I occasionally write pieces critical of the president's policy. I already did that with the Korea thing, all right? But I don't want you to think he's a stray electron. Okay? His world view, and I don't want to go there, but you know, you all heard this growing up, but don't make me stop this car, right? <laughs> okay? Does have a legitimate historical narrative in the American political experience. I actually think President Trump is the first Jacksonian president in the White House since um, Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Most amazingly, he surrounded himself by a whole bunch of folks who are really talented and are definitely not Jacksonians. He has surrounded himself with a bunch of American internationalists. Secretary Mattis, Tillerson, um, <clears throat> this head of the CIA, Pompeo, Director of National Intelligence, Coates, formerly Homeland Security Secretary, now Chief of Staff, John Kelly. These are all traditional American internationalists. These are all the people who would have answered that question Kagan asked, you know, World Order 1.0 is done, what are you guys gonna do for 2.0? These guys are saying, all right, where's the paper? Let's go. But you got a president whose natural instincts don't go there. This is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. A president, purely Jackson, Jacksonian, surrounding himself in the power ministries with traditional American internationalists. Now, closer into the president, okay, not the, the cabinet people, but closer into the president, I actually think the president has picked a bunch of folks who are far more Jacksonian, far more like-minded uh, with the president than they are with these guys, all right? But then again, they aren't staying around. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen a high casualty rate in the, in the folks around the inner office. The, the, the real heavy lifter on this slide is top right. Okay, that's H.R. McMaster, Army Lieutenant General. H.R.'s job is, is to be the bridge between the family and friends around the president and those folks on the last slide and all those power ministries. And that's a really hard job because fundamentally those guys on the outside are recommending things that are not naturally occurring to the president on the inside. That's the issue in Washington. That's why the rest of the world is scared to death of us. We are the most disruptive force on the planet right now because we're big, powerful, important, and no, no one knows where we're going. Last quote here, and we'll take some questions. This is from a friend of mine, David Rothkopf. That's a pretty good sum. That's a pretty good summary. I mean, we can argue about this is a good idea, or this is a good idea, or I'm over here. But can we all agree that this is really bad when it comes to conducting international affairs? So, some advice. And with that, I'm open to comments and questions for as long as they let me stand here. I'm, I'm, I'm told we have microphone runners here. Yes, so we're gonna go about 10 minutes over and take questions. If some of you have to leave because you have class, we understand. Uh, first question, I think we had it queued up. Andre, go ahead. So my first question um, has to do with you briefing the president. Um, so I'm a, I'm a student with the Center for National Security Studies here. Yeah. And in our classes, we learn how to do briefings and memos. Uh, to prepare us for a career in national security. So when you briefed the president, how did you brief him on these super complex issues, but uh, do it in like a, a simple, like short way? Sure, so first of all, you gotta know the president, because they're all different, and let me, let me tell you, you adapt to the president, all right? Carry Ohio, we change, all right? So, President Bush learned in the conversation. He was a reader, he really was. He and Karl Rove used to keep score how many books they read the last week, all right? And he, he would read all of our stuff, but fundamentally, he learned in, in this. So you had to be fully prepared to begin your formal thing and then have him interrupt about three sentences in, and then you're just in a skirmish. You, you need to understand, he's not mad at you. He's not necessarily disagreeing with you. That's how he learns. So that's how you do that. President Obama, President Obama is, I, I was his CIA chief for three weeks, all right? So the sample set here is pretty small, okay? <laughs> But President Obama, I think, learned in the quiet moment. President Obama learned in the reflection. 
President Obama learned in the reading. So you, you did the briefing, but you knew that the, the real event was going to take place somewhere later in the day in a quiet moment when he went back to the text and, and ruminated on it a bit. Uh, President Trump is a challenge, all right? Because he doesn't have, he, he doesn't have, he, President Bush was fairly inexperienced being governor of Texas, but he came from a Republican internationalist family, right? So, I mean, he's been around this a lot. Uh, President Obama is somewhat of a scholar, okay? President Trump's a real estate guy from Manhattan. And so he doesn't have this body of knowledge. So the, the first challenge is, what am I going to assume he knows without insulting him? Like, Mr. President, we're going to cover Iraq today. It's the big one on the right. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> probably, probably not a winner, all right? And, and, I, and I don't mean to be disrespectful of the president. What I'm just trying to describe is, where do you draw the line? Because over here, you want to talk to him about the Sunni-Shia split and how important that is to the current violence in the Middle East. So do you begin with, Mr. President, in 632, the prophet died. I mean, seriously. I mean, which, actually, you kind of have to know if you're going to understand what's going on now. So I don't envy the current guys. Uh, the, the president also is fairly impatient and he is prone to action. So one of the things you've got to be careful of is, you know, don't tee up stuff you can't live with. Ready? You, you got to know the client. And so if you've got a president who, who is slow to action, which I already said maybe President Obama was, you, you need to kind of grab him metaphorically by the lapels and Mr. President, this ISIS thing, you got to pay attention to me. All right? Whereas with President Trump, you, you, might, you might have to say, no, no, wait, wait, Mr. President, no, not time for decision yet. It's still in my box, not yours. All right? And... Anyway, what else? General Hayden, we're over here for a second okay. question. Okay. Right. Um, yes, hi, Victoria. Uh, I've got a question. So basically, previously you mentioned that Bosnia, Syria, and Iraq are, despite uh, official representations, they know never going to be the same state again. They know they're going to be united. For me, as a Ukrainian, it's interesting. Do you think Ukraine and Crimea are ever going to be united again, or it's already failed this year? It's, um, that's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, if, if reunited, not for a long time. Right? And, and, and that's not a question of justice. That's a question of power. And so, for example, those maps I told you, they tricked us. They said it was the map. Right? They used to always have little fine print things. You had to put your nose on the map to read that says the United States does not recognize the incorporation of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia into the Soviet Union. We stamped that on every map. And for most of my lifetime, I just thought that was a, a morally directed position. And it was good that we did it, but, well, but Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania are free and independent countries today. All right? But it took, it took a long time. So I think, I think the right position for us is to, we will not recognize the annexation of Crimea. We will not. And, um, you know, when you have Russian arguments, yes, but there was an election and most Crimeans want to live in or be part of Russia. Uh, the, the answer is, um, number one, I don't think that was a free and fair election. Although, number two, I do think in a free and fair election, because of the Russian-speaking population in Crimea, many, many would vote for unity with the Russians. But the comeback from the Russians is, all right, if you want a free and fair plebiscite in Crimea to break it off from the Ukraine, take a number, we're going to put it in line. We're going to do one in Dagestan. We're going to do one in Ingushetia. I'm, I'm listing all the autonomous regions inside the Russian Federation, none of whom are happy to be inside the Russian Federation. So, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm circling around your question. Uh, I, there's, I think there's a certain permanence to that. We, we need not accept it in any legal sense. We need to continue to punish because it was a, it was a wrong, uh, but I don't see redress happening rapidly. Who's got a mic? I have one oh, over here. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> I kind of laughed. Um, so from an anthropological standpoint, how does capitalism play into your role of the tectonics? Um, so a little bit out of my lane, okay? Uh, but, but, I, but, I do, but I do associate uh, some consistency between political and economic freedom, all right? That it's hard to think you're embracing one fully and not permitting at least some of the other, all right? So, so I, I do see that. 
Um, uh, you know, capitalism's got very rough edges. All right, they're back to uh, us. We are, we, are, we are incredibly successful. We really are. But we got marked down for distribution of wealth, which is also correct and fair. And we need to, we need to, to work on that. So I, I would be reluctant to impose state controls over market forces, but I, am re but I do recognize there are times when states must control unguarded, unleashed market forces. Um, I told you I don't know much about this. So I turned to David Brooks, the New York Times conservative correspondent. Brooks has a pretty healthy view of this, and he self-describes his view as Hamiltonian. All right? That yes, we need to have a strong government that occasionally intervenes in the economy for, for a greater good. Hi, thank you for coming today. Thank you. In your book and other media appearances, <laughs> You have insisted that vital information about Al-Qaeda came from torture te techniques, despite being contradicted by a thick Senate Intelligence Committee report, yeah. numerous journalistic investigation, and the accounts of several intelligence officers. When it comes to detainee deaths, innocent men wrongfully held in brutal conditions, and other abuses, will you attempt to make amends for your war crimes by no donating the profits made from your publications and fame to the families of innocent people your administration imprisoned, tortured, and killed? So. Where to begin? <laughs> First of all, we, we, did not, we did not identify what it was we did, nor did the Attorney General, actually several Attorney Generals, identify what we did as torture. So, so I, I have to quibble over the, the language and the premise uh, for, of your question. Um, anyone, everyone involved in the CIA detention interrogation program would be happy to stand in front of you, put the hand on the Bible, raise the right hand, and say it produced information otherwise unavailable, certainly otherwise unavailable in any timely manner that made it operationally relevant. We, there's no question we, we got uh, powerful, useful information from the detention interrogation program. So we now have a national debate about what it was we did. All right? um, and a convenient sentence for some people is, I don't want my country doing that, and it didn't work anyway. And the, and the official response, actually from Barack Obama's CIA, not just George Bush's, but the official response from Barack Obama's CIA is, the first half of that sentence, uh, I don't want my country doing that, is yours, and God bless you, we all went to the same high schools and colleges, we all share common values, and I understand that position totally. And I respect people who hold it. The back half of the sentence, and it didn't work anyway, is actually a matter of historical fact. And by and large, that's not yours, that's ours. And, and, and our historical record is that it did work. And, and so the noble, the, 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 the position you've got to have, I think, to have the moral high ground over us, all right, is that I don't want my country doing that, and I don't care whether it made, it, made us more safe, all right? Which is, which is a noble position for an individual, may not be a noble position for a government that actually has a legal and moral responsibility to defend the citizens of the country. <laughs> Who's got it? Uh, I'm, I'm right oh, over here. Okay. I was wondering if you could comment on the Mueller investigation into Trump, and can you include in your comments uh, accusations and suspicions about the fact that Russian banks have been funneling money to him? Maybe they were using it to launder uh, Russian mafia money. And also there was the idea that somebody got 19% of a big Russian oil field that's going to use pipelines that go through Crimea, and I'm wondering if you're yeah. familiar with that. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, I don't know anything about anything you just asked. <laughs> <clears throat> but being an intelligence officer, I will continue. <clears throat> um, I, I, I know nothing about the pipeline. All right, so sorry. Uh, on, the, on the Mueller investigation, you know, say a little note of Thanksgiving sometime during the day that we got a Bob Mueller. And we got him, he's willing to go do this after being director of the FBI, not 10, but 12 years. He stayed on longer. I mean, he, he is one of the uh, most upstanding public servants I've, I've ever seen. That's one. Number two, he will not be in, in front of you all on that final press conference 
and have somebody in the back row say, yeah, but did you look into that and, and not be able to say, oh yeah. So he is turning over every possible rock because he can't stand the question, but what about this? And he hasn't looked into, into this. And so this looks like an incredibly wide ranging investigation, but it may simply be what I just said. He has to make it exhaustive. It may not be he's pulling on a thread. It could be, but, 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 I, but I don't know. All right? Um, so that's the second thing I'd offer. Third, it's going to take a long time. We're not going to know until next summer. Easily, maybe a little longer. Fourth, I, I, I think they're going to drag up some issues for some people. They're not registering as the agent of a foreign power. Um, maybe some money problems. Maybe some offshore stuff, maybe some tax issues and so on. I, I do think that's almost inevitable, just given what it is I'm reading. I, I got no special knowledge on this. On the raw question of collusion, I really don't know. And to get that to a provable crime, I think will be very, very difficult. All right? Um, so you had the president's son and son-in-law and Paul Manafort taking the meeting from the Russian lawyer, the one to come talk about, I got dirt on Hillary Clinton, okay? That's beyond stupid, but it's probably not a crime, okay? For anybody who does this for a living, that was Russian soft approach. Use someone who doesn't have GRU or FSB on their business card, all right, to approach the Trump campaign to establish a relationship. You establish the fact that they will take the meeting, okay? You establish the fact that they're not uncomfortable linking sanctions and dirt on a political opponent. You look around after the meeting to see if your FBI surveillance has increased, and if it hasn't, you then conclude, okay, they didn't go to the feds. And oh yeah, you already got down payment number one on compromise, you know, compromising material, if you decide you ever want to go use it. So taking the meeting, not criminal, I, I think it was just, just really, really dumb. Okay? I, um, I wrote an article for the Washington Post. They asked me to. Okay? Uh, it was the Friday before the election. And it was all about the Trump campaign and the Russian connections. And this is before we knew a whole bunch of stuff we now know. But it was about Manafort and um, Roger Stone and, and, and others and the connections. And then uh, Donald Jr. said, we got a lot of Russian money. And... You know, it, it just, and the fact the president would never say anything bad about Putin. It, it just, I, can't, so I can't explain any of this. It's just weird. Why, why, why is all that? And at the end, I said, look, I'm an intelligence guy. Uh, I get paid to kind of put these things together to give you an hypothesis as to what's going on here. So the one I came up with, I used a Russian word from the Soviet period. It was a word they used to describe someone who was naive, whom, whom, whom they personally kind of had contempt for, but they were quite enthusiastic about exploiting that person for their own purposes. The Russian word is Pelesny Durak. Useful idiot. <laughs> and, I, and I said, no, this is probably, probably going to offend some of my friends who are supporters of candidate Trump. And I mean no offense, but frankly, it's the most benign interpretation of these events that I can come up with. And I'm thinking that's the high probability shot of where we end. Well, that's a happy note to close it on. <laughs> a round of applause, please. <laughs> General Michael Hayden. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Just a quick hint. March 7th will be the spring presidential lecture. Uh, Hugh Hare, professor at MIT, WAMPUT, who works with robotic legs and arms and is also a rock climber himself with double amputee robotic legs. So come join us for that as well. Thank you.